good time for the whole country. Karibuni sana for all our visitors. Uh, my name is Judin Jerry Geshoro, and I'm privileged to be the lead pastor here at the Nairobi Chapel, Lavington. This month, we are starting a new series that is on prayer, a very important topic, especially because of the times we are living and also because of where we are at as a nation. If there is anything that is going to keep this country sober, is your prayers and my prayers. Because there are many opinions flying all over social media and everywhere. Everybody has something to say. But prayer gets us to a place where we communicate with God. And it's different from talking to God, but communicating with him. Because communication is not complete until there is a response, isn't it? And, but talking, you can talk to someone, but not wait for them to hear what they have to say. You have not communicated. All you've done is talk to that person. But in communication, you talk to the person, and you give them an opportunity to speak back. Then there is communication. And our God still speaks. And many times, because of what we are going through, Sometimes as Christians, we forget this truth and we, our idea of prayer becomes that one of talking to God. And we wonder why God is not answering our prayers sometimes, but it's because we, after we talked, we didn't give him an opportunity to respond, even though sometimes he will respond by saying no, sometimes he will respond by saying wait, sometimes he will respond by saying not now or yes. But God still speaks. And the privilege that we have as the people who are alive today is that we have God's word. Because that's one way that God speaks to us. So even as we pray, to, as we talk about prayer, during my sermon, at some point I will pause um, and we will continue with prayer. And so I will ask the band to join me as I preach. So there is no magical formula for prayer. In the simplest of terms, prayer is, in, is communication with God. It's where we get to talk to him. We spend time in his presence, drawing near to him. Through prayer, we express adoration and thanks to God, and we make our requests known to him. We have an opportunity to intercede for others through prayer, and we learn more about the character of God and his will over our lives. And so if prayer is a place where we seek God, where we also get to intercede for others. I want to give you a moment, even as we proceed with this sermon, to think of some of the things you would like to bring to God in prayer today. Because we will not just talk about prayer, but we will get to pray. What are some of the things that are in your heart and mind this morning that you would like to bring before the Lord in prayer? That you think about them as we continue. Prayer is a place where we get to intercede for others. Is there someone who you are praying, you are praying for in this season? I don't know what could be going on in their lives. They could be sick. It could be that you just have a burden for a family member who is not born again, and you desire that one day they would know the truth and the freedom of having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that should Jesus come back for them today, you would be, you would be sure of where they have gone. I carry that burden for one of my siblings, and every time I get an opportunity to pray, I tell God, remember him. From wherever he is, may he find the light. May he get to know you as his Lord and Savior. Who are you praying for today and what's going on in their lives? Because I'll give you an opportunity as we continue with this sermon for you to actually bring them before the Lord. Prayer, it's in the place of prayer that we get to understand the character of God and his will over our lives. And I pray that as we go through scripture, that that will come out, that you get to see the character of God. Because every time we go into scripture, we say we look for three things. How is God at work? How is the enemy at work? Because the enemy is always at work. And there's this scripture, I like quoting, it's in, it's in one, of, one of our banners here. Revelation 12, 12, it says that the enemy was thrown down on earth after he, he sinned in heaven. And so the devil was thrown down on earth. And when he was thrown down on earth, the Bible says that he said that he understood that his time is short. And so he's moving with speed and with fury. So we know we have an enemy. So every time we go into scripture, 
we must find out how is God working and how was the enemy working even during that time. And then the last question is how are God's people responding? Because many times, unfortunately, even though we are God's people, and that's why it's important for us to understand the character of God, sometimes we remember more of what the enemy can do, myself included. There are many times I, I can complain a lot and just remember everything that can go wrong. Because at that point, I have forgotten the object of my prayer and who it is that I'm dealing with. Because when you go to scripture, you will definitely see how the devil is frustrating God's people. But if you look keenly, you will also see how God is consistent in his ways and how he is a promise keeper and how his people always had the opportunity to make a choice, either to, either to believe what God is saying or to go by their feelings or what they can see with their eyes, even though a lot of goodness have been established in the spiritual realms by our Father in heaven. And so as we talk about prayer, it gives us an opportunity to know, think, and remind ourselves about the character of God and his will for our lives. Because when that is in place, our prayers changes. We pray very differently. We stop talking to God and we say, we take time to hear him so that communication can take place. It's through prayer that we get to grow in our relationship with God, and we also get to connect with God by the power of, the, of his indwelling spirit. So the privilege that we have is, as God's creation is that prayer is a uniquely human activity. No other beings have the privilege of communicating in such a way with their maker and their redeemer. Isn't it a beautiful thing? that God gave us that special privilege that he didn't give the rest of creation, that we can communicate with him. And so I want us to pray and bring the needs that you have before the Lord today and ask him to open our eyes that we may be able to see how he is at work in his word and that at the end of the day, he will help us to make the right choice. Father, we come before your presence this morning and we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to talk about prayer this month. We gather before your presence, acknowledging that, Lord, you know each and every one of us by name. That, Lord, you are aware of everybody that is gathered here today. You know their prayers. You know what it is that they are carrying within their hearts. Lord, as we talk about prayer, may this not just be a conversation, but may it do something new in our lives. Because whenever your word goes out, it never comes back void without accomplishing the purpose to which it was sent. Lord, you have also said that you will watch over your word to accomplish it. And so Jehovah God, if that is a promise, then we can go into scripture, we can bring the needs that we carry within us today and know that Jehovah God, we have the front row opportunity to watch you accomplish your word over our lives. And so we thank you, King of all glory, because you know every need that is represented in this place. You know the people that we are praying for. Some of the prayers we have, we feel so helpless because left to us, we could have solved it. But now we know that it's actually a privilege to partner with you, dear Lord, and to call upon your name to help us. As we pray for people that we love and that we are carrying in our hearts this day, desiring that you'll be at work in their lives. Father God, have your way. Come and do that which only you can do, my Father. Reveal your character to us, Jehovah God. King of all glory, help us to understand your will. So that as we come in prayer, Lord, we don't just come with our needs and our desires and our speed, demanding that you do certain things for us, talking to you, but not allowing you to talk to us. May your will be done. Because we know part of your will is that you want to speak to each and every one of us. We honor you and we give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the chat said, Amen. So the title that I've given our sermon today is God Will Set Things Right. Please tell your neighbor, God will set things right. So I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 1 to 18. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 1 to 18. 
The Bible says, maybe before I read, I can share the context a bit. No, let me do it the other way around. Let me start with the scripture. Chapter 33, verse 1 to 18 from the message version. While Jeremiah was still locked up in jail, a second message from God was given to him. This is God's message. The God who made earth, made it livable and lasting, known everywhere as God. He says, call to me and I will answer you. I will tell you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. Verse 4. This is what God, the God of Israel, has to say about what's going on in this city. About the homes of both people and kings that have been demolished. About all the ravages of war and the killing by the Chaldeans. And about the streets littered with the dead bodies of those killed because of my raging anger. About all that's happened because the evil actions in this city have turned my stomach in disgust. But now take another look. I am going to give this city a thorough renovation, working a true healing inside and out. I am going to show them life whole, life brimming with blessings. I will restore everything that was lost to Judah and Jerusalem. I will build everything back as good as new. I will scrub them clean from the dirt they have done against me. I will forgive everything they have done. Everything. I will forgive all their rebellions. And Jerusalem will be a center of joy and praise and glory for all the countries on earth. Can you imagine us calling Nairobi a center of joy? They will get reports on all good I am doing for her. They will be in awe of the blessings I am pouring on her. Yes, God's message. You are going to look at this place, these empty and desolate towns of Judah and streets from Jerusalem and say, a wasted land, unlivable. Not even a dog could live here. But the time is coming when you are going to hear laughter and celebration, marriage festivities, people exclaiming, thank God for the angel armies. He is so good. His love never quits as they bring thank offerings into God's temple. I will restore everything that was lost in this land. I will make everything as good as new. I, God, say so. God of the angel army says, this coming desolation, unfit for even a stray dog, is once again going to become a pasture for shepherds who care for their flocks. You will see flocks everywhere, in the mountains around the towns of Shep Shephela and Negev, all over the territory of Benjamin, around Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. Flocks under the care of shepherds who keep track of each sheep. God says so. Verse 14, watch for this. This is coming, God's decree, when I will keep the promise I made to the families of Israel and Judah. When that time comes, I will make a fresh and true shoot sprout from the David tree. He will run this country honestly and fairly. He will set things right. Tell your neighbor, God will set things right. That's when Judah, that's when Nairobi, that's when Kenya will be secure. And Nairobi will live in safety. The motto for the city will be, God has set things right for us. God has made it clear that there will always be a descendant of David ruling the people of Israel and that there will always be Levitical priests on hand to, off, to, to offer burnt offerings, present grain offerings, and carry on the sacrificial, of, um, sac the sacrificial worship in my honor. We say that the title for our sermon today is that God will set things right. This prophecy, it's worth noting, however, that, that this, this prophecy came in a time where, uh, where things were really difficult. The promises were spoken to address a dire situation. Because the armies of King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, 
were advancing towards Jerusalem. God had spoken to the people in Jerusalem many times and they would disobey him. So actually, if you read through the Old Testament, you will notice that King Nebuchadnezzar was used by God four different times to go to Jerusalem and he would come with a group of people who would be captives and they would become exiles in the land of Babylon. The fourth time was the last one and that's where we find people like Daniel, Meshach and Abednego, the young people who found themselves with during the fourth trip. The reason God was allowing this was because the people in Jerusalem had refused to honor his prophets and they had refused to disobey him. So King, um, King Nebuchadnezzar advances to Jerusalem and the streets of Jerusalem so will soon be filled with the corpses of her people. If you read chapter 33 verse 4 to 5 it shows us that it shows that there was going to be a time like of darkness. God was going to allow very difficult things to happen to the people who are the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the prophet Jeremiah himself was impr imprisoned by the king of his own land who was King Zedekiah. So so where they were, the king was Zedekiah, where the people were disobedient. But God used another king called Nebuchadnezzar to go to them from Babylon to kill them and to bring some of them with him as exiles in Babylon. So before this, the prophet Jeremiah was one of the people that God used to speak to these people who had refused to obey God. And he had given them many prophecies of judgment. And these prophecies that had, land, had actually landed him in prison. Because whenever he came and said what God was saying, the people would not like him. And at some point they told the king, put him in prison. And that's why we ask you this morning, have you ever found yourself in trouble? Because of doing the right thing. Jeremiah was only obeying God, but as a result he found himself in prison. But still in the midst of catastrophe, the prophet finally speaks words of promise. In the previous chapter, we actually see him, that is chapter 32 of Jeremiah, we see him buying a piece of land, which would be considered a foolish thing to do because Nebuchadnezzar was already con conquering uh, the people of Jerusalem. It's like, you know, right now in Kenya, a lot of people are not investing. People are keeping their money either in the house or wherever it is, because there are rumors of war. Uh, we do not know. I mean, in, I know we are in church, but sometimes, as much as we are people of faith, when we think about elections, people have plan Bs. But today we want to encourage us that our plan B will be prayer, that we can believe that God can do something. Because Jeremiah, while he knew that things were very thick, in a time where people would not go buying land, that's when he actually bought a piece of land, which we can say it's a foolish thing to do in a country that was going to be soon conquered by an invading army. Nevertheless, he purchased the land as a pledge, as earnest God's redemption. The same way we've planted a tree there during our anniversary. It's not because planting trees have any magic or anything, but there was a message behind it. And by faith, we were saying that there are things we believe God is replanting. So for Jeremiah, he went and bought a piece of land in a time where everybody was holding their money because you want to wait and see how things are going to be before you can release your money to the economy. But the Bible tells us in chapter 2, verse 15, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. In the midst of impending doom, a sign of hope is enacted. So he was part of the people who believed that no matter how things looked, things were going to change. So in chapter 33, the prophet speaks of the coming restoration, the restoration of normal everyday life, that there will come a time in the land of Judah where there shall once more be heard the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom and the voice of the bride. That's what we see in chapter 33, verse 10 to 11. And now in this passage, Jeremiah speaks of the restoration of daily life as momentous as it was. But also one of the chief signs of God's favor was the restoration of the Davidic line. 
this Davidic line is the genealogy in which we find Jesus Christ. The other day when we were preaching, we talked about Joseph and how he found himself in trouble in Egypt and how he had to go through all that. Why God spared his family to a point they were given a piece of land by Pharaoh just because God needed to spare this family because out of that lineage, we were going to have Jesus Christ born. So the same thing, the prophet here was hopeful because he knew that one of the chief signs of God's favor is that he was going to restore the, uh, the Davidic line. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 says, A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The image is one of hope and unexpected joy. Because people are going through so much. So the joy was actually unexpected. So the image is one of hope and unexpected joy. New life springing up from what looks like a dead stump. I don't know what you see when you look around it's not been an easy time. But one of the biggest signs that is a gift to the church is for us to acknowledge the consistency of our God, that he doesn't change in character, that he is a promise keeper, that no matter what we are going through across the globe, things are not easy, but that God is still with us, that there's been other generations of people that have found themselves in a dark time like we have been going through. But there, we, amongst them, we had some who still remembered the character of God and they kept holding on to him. Prophet Jeremiah being one of them. So that in a space like that, he was able to exhort the people and tell them, call unto God and he will answer you. He will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. And sometimes when you say such a thing to people who can't see what you're saying in, with their physical eyes. It just needs us to be strengthened in our faith, to be able to understand that God is at work in the spiritual realms and that we will not limit him because of the things we are seeing with our physical eyes. One of the chief tragedies of the Babylonian exile, of course, was the end of the Davidic dynasty. So for nearly 400 years, the descendants, the descendants of David had occupied the throne of Judah. And God had promised that it would always be so. That is, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7 or Psalm 89. But at this point, the Babylonians destroyed the David city and they burned Solomon's temple. So they had nothing to show the children that were born during that time or to help them to start talking about their God. That's why when you see a time comes where now a different prophet, Nehemiah and Ezra, God is using them to take the people back to the land of Jerusalem because he had not just prophesied doom, but he had said a time would come where they would be moved away from this place place of exile back to their land, even though it took them 70 years. That when God was using prophet Ezra, we see a, a point where they had to be taught the basics of faith from scratch. Because after such a long period of not hearing, hearing the goodness of God declared, then they didn't know who God was. So ourselves, we've gone through a tough time. I don't know what for you, what your story is. Is it about your marriage? Is it about your business? Is, is it about your health or the health of a loved ones? Have, are you lacking peace in a certain area of your life? Is it anxiety? Is it rumors of war? Nobody really knows what will happen, you know? Uh, right now, there are so many jokes about Russia and uh, Ukraine. But there are people who have genuine fears of what that can, what would come out of that. And this is not nothing new in scripture. The Bible says that in the last days, there shall be rumors of war. People shall experience very tough times. So if we subscribe to scripture, then we shouldn't be shocked at the times we are living in. We should be asking what is the proper response for those of us who are believers when life gets to a place like that. Because people who know God respond to challenges or ought to respond to challenges differently. Prophet Jeremiah gives us an example 
that even though because of doing the right thing he found himself in prison when God gave him another message to declare to the people he didn't say first get me out of prison then I will declare the message that while still in prison prophet Jeremiah still spoke to the people and encouraged them to call unto God Pastor Ndwati, when he was praying here, he talked about, he may, helped us pray for people in our lives when we were talking about our everyday livelihoods. People either who could be giving us a tough time at work or whatever it is. When we talk about Christians respond differently to challenges, is that some, some people will choose to respond to challenges by complaining, by gossiping, by quitting and there are, sometimes there's a place for complaining you know if you're venting and there's a place for quitting if you can see there's no solution but just like prophet Jeremiah as Christians we are supposed to ask God what am I supposed to do in this situation because Jeremiah didn't was still in prison but he still saw himself as a messenger of messenger of God that you could be working for a very difficult boss but that could be one of the reasons you are there. Because God wants you to pray for that person. Because maybe he is fighting battles that you have no idea about back at home or in another area of his life. And maybe it's because of you being a believer who understands I'm not just here for a job. But I'm here for God to use me to make a difference in the lives of people. That even when we are going through a tough time, we still become servants of God while in our own prisons. Jeremiah was still in prison, but he allowed God to use him to serve the people of that time. Our theme verse for this year, and you can see our banners here, our theme, our theme for the year is we're talking about going back to basics with an emphasis of on authentic relationships. And our theme verse says that by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfish concern for one another. And I want us again to take some moment and pray for people who have not made us necessarily very happy right now. And we don't even think that they are the first people we should pray about. Jeremiah was not in a place that was a happy place, but he still, still stood in the gap and obeyed God. That we will pray and ask God, why have you allowed this to happen at this point? How do you want me to pray for this person who is making my life difficult? What is going on in their lives? How can I pray for them? Because sometimes it's not always about us. Sometimes in our Christianity, God wants to use us in that painful place to be a blessing to that person who again could be lost in something that they have no idea about. Because even as we talk about that calling upon the Lord and that he will reveal great and unsearchable things that we do not know about, there's no other way that God reveals these things. It's in our everyday life when he chooses to work on you as an individual so that you can be a blessing to that person who does not deserve it because we do not deserve many things that our God does for us. But he still stands in the gap on our behalf. So let me give you an opportunity. You may not be having someone who you're not in good terms with. But pray. Pray for us. Even for us as a country. That wherever we are. That we will not be the people who complain. The people who when everybody else is posting whatever they want on social media. They, we can't tell the difference between who is a Christian and who is not. Because we Many people are not speaking life. So let's just spend some time in prayer. Father, we thank you for your words. And that you're teaching us something from the life of Jeremiah. That Lord, this guy had done the right thing. When you told him to go and minister to the people in Jerusalem. And to pass on the prophecies and the messages that you had for them. He did his best. But because of obeying you and because of doing the right thing, he found himself in trouble. That the masses told the king, put him in prison. And he was imprisoned. But God, while he was still in that place, you came and found him. And you still use him, dear father. And you told him, now speak a life, 
a message of life and restoration to the people. Tell my people to call upon me and I will answer them. That there are things I want to show them, things that they have never seen, things that their networks can't bring their way, things that their money can't bring their way. That they should call upon me and I will show them great and unsearchable things that they do not know. Heavenly Father, we stand before your presence as an Nairobi Chapel Lovington family. We acknowledge that you are at work in our lives, even in the difficult of places, Jehovah. And to, to this afternoon, Jehovah God, we come before your presence. And we ask that, Lord, you give us the heart like that one of Jeremiah. That we will be able to stand in the gap even when doing the right thing becomes the costly things. Sometimes standing for the truth of your word makes it difficult because people have preferences. And sometimes we prefer our own choices and preferences and our way of seeing things over what your word demands of us. God, forgive us for times that we have prioritized our feelings, our desires and what we want over the truth of your your word, my Father. Help us, Jehovah God, that just like Jeremiah, we will be able to spot opportunities that are not usual, opportunities that are even hurting us. And at that point, we will invite the help of the Holy Spirit and ask Him to help us to know how to pray for the person that is making life difficult. Because having prayed this year, as an Nairobi Chapel Lovington, you gave us the theme of authentic relationships. It wasn't enough to go through a sermon series, oh God, but we must speak, keep going back to your word. And all these truths that we learned from that text, Jehovah God. That authentic relationships will move us from a place of self-preservation to a place of self-disclosure. That we will continuously find people and places where we can go to for help. Because the journey that you have put us on, Lord, is not necessarily easy. It's one thing, Jehovah God, to to close ourselves in and when we come out to show a certain image, but on the inside we are struggling. But Jehovah God, your word says that there we know you are my disciples if you have love for one another and unselfish concern for one another. And there's no better way for this truth to be tested than when we find ourselves in a place where we don't deserve the treatment we are getting but we can extend unselfish concern for one another. So everything that we have on these banners, Lord, we ask that you help us to live out these truths for the glory and honor of your holy name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. And the church said, So to our people that were dev devastated by loss, Jeremiah's prophecy offered them hope. And he told them that days are coming surely, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. All might seem lost, but God is still faithful. The house of David might be cut down, but God is able to bring life out of death because a branch will sprout out. Amen. So like Jeremiah, it's important we understand. We said when we go to scripture, we need to find out how God is working, how enemy, the enemy is at work. But in this case, we see that Jeremiah demonstrates to us that he understood who the object of his prayers was. So God goes ahead and declares to himself, to Jeremiah, by reminding him, that he was the all-powerful God who created and formed all things. And this is the same God we are dealing with. But just think about it. Do you really believe in it? That God is all-powerful. That he's our creator and he created all things. Because when we allow some of these truths to sink, we pray very different prayers. Because we know who the object of our prayer is. Jeremiah might have struggled in his mind, but he still chose to worship God and to speak truth.
if you look at Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 4 to 5 it almost feel like we have jumped into another passage of scripture after God has told him to tell the people to call upon him and he will reveal great and mighty things they do not know one minute we are given exciting promises of answered prayers and great things ahead the next minute a bunch of people die and God is furious and we ask what's happening here by the time we get to verse 6 it looks like we are back on track again because now God is speaking hope again so the question is is verse 4 and 5 misplaced and the answer is no what is happening is that God is showing Jeremiah that judgment must come first and redemption second. That was true that time and it's true right now. Many of us desire redemption, but we must first pass through the place of judgment where God says, if you do this, then I will respond to you like this. We do not always see what God is doing behind the scenes. Yes, yet he invites us to call unto him and to trust him anyway. He promises to show us great and mighty things. The great and mighty things are his healing, bringing peace and truth, rebuilding, restoring, and showing mercy. But we cannot miss the source of it all. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why they said that a, a branch will sprout again. From the line of David, Jesus Christ was born so that we can receive the gift of salvation that he has given us. And after that, we would know the redemption that we really need and we are looking for. That God must deal with the sin first before we can see the great and mighty things. So we are also called to speak a word of hope and promise in a world often filled with fear and uncertainty. Because after a long wait, a branch will sprout. Please tell your neighbor a branch will sprout. So the question is, have you allowed it to happen in your own heart? Because Jesus came. These people are being told about a branch that is Jesus Christ who had not come. But he came and he died on the cross. But have we allowed him to sprout in our hearts? Because he brings all the changes. So as I come to the close, there are three categories of people or kinds of prayers that we want to make. And this one, I, I felt specifically God gave it to me because there, there's somebody who needs to hear this today. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 2 to 5, we see two sons, Abel and Cain. And the Bible says in verse 2 to 5 that then she bore again, this is Eve, this time his brother Abel, and now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that the Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Verse 11 says, For... Um, oh. Yeah, let me reach there for now. So in this text, as you continue, there's a part where God speaks to Cain and he tells him, because now Cain was angry because God received the sacrifice of his brother differently and he did not receive it with the same gladness that he received his. And Cain was angry and jealous. And the Bible says that he actually killed his brother. But before he killed his brother, God gave him a warning and he told him, sin is crouching at your door and you must master it. But he did not master it. Through anger, he killed his brother. And many times when we read that text, we feel like God is not fair because why would he accept the sacrifice of one person and not of the other? But we usually say that scripture interprets scripture. And there are two other texts that allows us to be able to interpret that text for us to see that Jesus, God was not being 
uh, didn't have you know Abel as his favorite. If you read First John chapter three verse eleven to twelve, the Bible says, "For this is the message that you had from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous." All scripture is good breath and is supposed to teach us for righteousness. And so this scripture tells, gives us more information that the reason why Cain killed his brother was because his works was evil and his brother was righteous. So God accepted the sacrifice of Cain in a different way. If you read Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4, the Bible says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and through it, he, be, his, he being dead still speaks. So as a result of his sin, then God could see much deeper. He told Cain, sin is crouching at your door and you must master it. And because he did not master the sin, he found himself in deeper trouble because of the decisions that he made after that. And this morning, there is someone that God is speaking to. That sin is crouching at your door. Even as we talk about call unto me and I will answer you. That we see even in that text of Jeremiah chapter 33. That God was very keen that for him to restore the people, he was going to restore Jesus to them. That it's only when we walk with the Lord Jesus a certain way that we really get this, the fruit, the things we are looking for as we pray. So sometimes one of the reasons why we make prayers and we don't see God coming through is because God is waiting for us to master the sin in our lives. Because if we don't master the sin, it's going to master us. And we can see that in the example of Cain. So there are some of us who are trusting God and we talk as we talk about watching and praying. And God is saying, it's not that I don't hear you. I want you to cooperate with me. I want you to take, to respond to the things I'm telling you to stop doing or to start doing. And when we talk about sin, it's actually all of us. So before we go to the other part, um, which is my last part for this sermon, I want you to think about some of the things that you want to bring before the Lord in repentance. First, in confession, because we confess, but repentance is when we stop doing it and we turn around. And just think about something that you want to bring the Lord and ask him for forgiveness. And ask him to help you because Jesus is willing to help us. And the other prayer that we want to make is... Okay, I didn't put that text here, but it's a text from 2 Kings chapter 6, I think verse 1 to 7. If we have it, we can put it up. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go... Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down. But as, we, as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there and he made the iron float. Verse 7, therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. So this scripture, we see people who are stepping out to do something good. They want to build a structure where people who are learning how to be prophets can come and operate from. And Elisha is with them who is their mentor. And now because one of them had borrowed an axe, it, 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 uh, the axe head fell in the water. And he was worried because it was borrowed. He was wondering, what will I tell the owner of this axe? But then they threw a piece of the tree, like of wood, 
on that river and the axe head floated. And we know that usually metal does not float on water. But that's what happens because that piece of wood represents the cross of Jesus Christ. That when he, that power of what Jesus did on the cross comes, things that are unusual usually happens. And that there are people, even as we talk about us praying against any sin in our lives, the second category of people we want to pray about is there are people who stepped out to do something they meant well. You probably borrowed, literally like this person, to do your business or to do something, and it didn't work out. And today we are saying... We can exert the power of the cross like that wood that was thrown on that, inside that river and the axe head floated. That you can go to God and say, I was borrowing to do business and things have not worked out. But if I come to you in prayer, the same way you allowed that axe head to float on water. I don't know what you're going to do. But for me, what I understand is that there are people, as you make this prayer, God is going to do something very unusual. Something that you cannot explain. Because nobody can explain how an axe head, which is metal, can float on water. But because of this wood which is symbolic for what Jesus accomplished on the cross, then we can go with confidence. Having dealt with our personal sin, we can now go on this other side and pray and tell God, this is my situation. I intended it for good, but now I'm in pain and I'm hurting. And God is able and is faithful. I invite us to stand as we make this prayer. So we want to pray for anybody who, who has borrowed because they wanted some, to do something good and they have found themselves in trouble. We want to pray for people who have stepped out to do something good, not necessarily because they borrowed, but they, you found yourself in trouble as well. Jeremiah did the right thing, but because of doing the right thing, he found himself in trouble. But on the other hand, everything that God said he would accomplish that time, there's one thing he was not going to ignore, and it was the sin of his people. It's a sin of his people that made them to find themselves in Babylon. But it's also because of the sin of his people that he gave his only begotten son. So he gave a solution for it. And so today when we say, call upon me and I will show you great and mighty things. It's in this context that we must get rid of sin in our lives. But on the other hand, we must be willing to obey the Lord even when it hurts. But also, based on the last text in the Second Kings, that our God is faithful. He is able to turn around things on our behalf in a way that we cannot explain. Father, we thank you for your word. King of all glory, as we talk about prayer, this morning you're reminding us that we must look within. And if there is anything that comes in the way, that does not allow us to thrive in our relationship with you, that Jehovah God, you forgive us. Help us, Jehovah God, that we will call it by name, that we will confess our sins and call them by name. Because even though we may not do that, it doesn't mean that you're not aware of it. So I pray for each and every one of us that in our times of prayer and even right now, the things that we are confessing before you, Lord, we are asking for your forgiveness in Jesus' name. Forgive us for times that we have complained instead of speaking life, the life of your word, where our country is concerned, where our own lives, our own businesses are concerned. Forgive us for the times we have believed in what the enemy can do more than what you can do. Because indeed, whenever we go into scripture, we can see the enemy at work. We can see God at work. But it may it be that in our own lives, when people look at us, they will see more of God. Because complaining is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. I pray that Jehovah Father, you will give us the true fruit of the Holy Spirit which is kindness, which is patience, which is the ability to suffer long, oh God. Which is joy, my Father. I pray that when people look at us, because we are allowing you to purge us, Jehovah, that when we are squeezed in a time that is dark, that out of us will overflow the fruit of the Holy Spirit. All of us have this opportunity for as long as we are interacting with other people. For as long as we leave our doors and go outside. Every day we will have opportunities 
to either complain or to invite you and ask you, help us, our Father, that will demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit because you live within us, Jehovah. And so I pray that would you help us to be people that speak life in Jesus' name. King of all glory, if there's any hidden sin in our lives, today we acknowledge that we know it's only hidden from the next person but not from you. And so we stand before your presence and we ask, please help us, Jehovah God. Forgive us for anybody that has struggled and they don't know how to let go. I pray that you surround them with the help that they need. That they will walk true in your presence, Jehovah Father. They will be authentic in their walk with you. That they will not play church and religion, my Father. But instead, they will find the freedom that comes in knowing you in a personal way and allowing you to be on the driver's seat of their lives. Forgive us for times that we've made excuses, excusing sin over the truth of your word. Heavenly Father, forgive us. And I pray that truly we will know the freedom that comes from surrendering our lives to you, from allowing you to clean us up. Because it doesn't matter how we look in the eyes of many. Heavenly Father, help us to prioritize that we care more about how you view us, how you see us, and how we obey you. Lord, there are times you've asked us to do things that have put us in trouble like Jeremiah. King of all glory in the times that we are living in, believing in your word and standing by it is courage. It takes courage. To take the truth of your word and say, this is what I stand for. Heavenly Father, I pray that you give us that courage. That even if we find ourselves in trouble because we chose to do the right thing. King of all glory. None of us has, has reached that place of being put in prison because of obeying you. But we see the people of old had that. But we also know that we are living in times where because of speaking the truth of God's word. You can be taken to prison because you speak against certain things that are human rights out here but are against your word. Lord, I pray that you give us you, the, the strength and you grow our conviction that we'll be willing to stand for what is right. And for those people who have found themselves in debt because they wanted to do the right thing and just like this mentee of Elisha they borrowed and then they lost whatever it is that they borrowed for whatever they wanted to build. I pray that Lord have mercy. The same way you are the same God, you're consistent in your ways. You say you will watch over your word to perform it. That Jehovah God, you will give them ideas that are divine. That Lord, you will solve their problems in a divine way. That they will not be able to explain because nobody can explain how metal floated on water that day. All we know is that Jehovah God, because of the piece of wood that symbolizes what you have done on the cross on our behalf, that the debt that we have will be paid by you, literally. But also the debt of sin, dear Father, that we have, you have paid for it, Jehovah. And while we were called sinners today, we can be called the righteousness of God. And that while we were going to face death, today we can live because of what you have done. And we can walk free without anyone questioning us. May we walk in the freedom that comes from knowing you, Jehovah. And may these words that call upon me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things. Be real in our lives for the glory and honor of your name. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and give thanks. And the chat said... And the chat said, so I pray that you'll go out, you will call upon the Lord, no matter what is going on in your life. God is willing to show you great and unsearchable things that you have never thought about. He will do things that you cannot even explain to people with words because we are dealing, the object of our prayer is a supreme being that cannot be explained and he's faithful and consistent in his character. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you and have a lovely week. Let's call upon the Lord. <laughs>